So in today's lesson, we'll be looking at some of the social, political, and economic challenges faced by Canadians following World War I. Even though the war was over, there were still plenty of significant issues that Canadians faced as they moved into the 1920s. And in this lesson today, these are some of the issues that we're going to be looking at. We're going to start off by looking at some political changes that happened going into the 1920s. We're going to look at the effects of the Spanish flu pandemic. We're going to look at issues faced by soldiers as they returned home from the war. And then finally, we're going to close off by looking at labor unrest and the Winnipeg general strike. So following World War I, Canada found itself with a new prime minister. In July 1920, Prime Minister Borden retired and Arthur Meehan became the new prime minister. Now, Meehan was appointed leader of the Conservative Party. He was not elected into this position. And at the time of his transition, there were many political issues that Meehan was faced with. For one, there were still many tensions between French and English Canadians. Remember back to the conscription crisis during World War I. A lot of those tensions are still around going into the 1920s. Many French felt alienated from the rest of Canada. And we started to see groups form in opposition to English Canadian interests. Groups like the Action Nationale, which was formed to protect French culture. There was also trouble in the maritime provinces. as They faced higher taxes on goods. Uh, that in, as a result, trade suffered. Um, this caused mass migration to central Canada. So we started to see the population of the maritime provinces dwindling. The prairies also suffered after the war. Um, this is because of a collapse in the price of wheat that followed the war. And as a result, many other countries could not afford to buy Canadian wheat, which cost more. And this angered many farmers. They were outraged by the high tariffs on farm equipment and their inability to trade their products. And as a result, a new political party was formed called the Progressive Party. And in the election of 1921, they won 65 seats, the third most in the parliament. And speaking of the 1921 federal election, this is when we have a new prime minister elected. In 1921, a Liberal government was elected, and this meant that the new Prime Minister was William Lyon Mackenzie King. He would go on to be Canada's longest-serving Prime Minister. Now, following the war, Canadians were also faced with a deadly flu pandemic, the Spanish flu. The pandemic lasted from January 1918 to December 1920, and it came in two waves. This flu pandemic was caused by the H1N1 flu virus, which is a particularly deadly strain of the flu. Now, it had been spread among soldiers in World War I, and the pandemic was made worse when the soldiers began to return home. Now, this is a bit of a paradox here, because in a normal flu season, there's always these different strains of the flu virus going around. But in a normal year, it's generally the less severe form that gets passed around. Um, think of those who get, you know, more sick. They tend to be in bed, they're, you know, unable to get out of bed, you know, for a week or maybe weeks. Um, maybe they have to go to the hospital, but they're not really interacting with lots of other people. Whereas those who get a less severe form of the flu, they might stay home from a day, for a day or two from work or from school, but then they kind of go back on with their lives. And as a result, they're passing this strain on to others. So in a normal year, it's those who have the less severe form that pass on that virus. The, less, the more deadly one uh, tends not to get passed on. The opposite was happening with this flu pandemic, though, and this has to do with the war. If soldiers in the trenches got the less severe form of the flu, they were only a little bit sick, they had, you know, a runny nose and a cough and a fever, they were probably going to be told they had to keep fighting because they needed soldiers for the war. However, those who got really sick, who had a really high fever and, you know, maybe had more severe symptoms or complications, those are the ones who actually got sent home for treatment. So this is how the flu virus got spread around the world, this really deadly form. And this was a huge problem. It's estimated around the world to have killed between 50 and 100 million people. And at that time, that equates to about 3 to 5 percent of the world's population. And so on this graph here, you can see another deadly effect of the Spanish flu, which was that it killed otherwise healthy people. So the dotted line here on this graph is showing what the deaths in a normal flu year look like. And as you can see here, those who are most likely to die are those who are very young and those who are very old. However, in 1918, the solid line here with the Spanish flu 
we see this bump up in otherwise healthy individuals, those in their middle age, from about 15 years old up to about uh, those in their mid-40s. We also see a spike in flu deaths there. So otherwise healthy individuals, this flu virus attacked their immune systems and made it work against themselves. So otherwise healthy people are getting killed by this flu virus. It's not just the young and the old. And as you can imagine, this had a huge impact on Canadians. It's estimated to have killed at least 50,000 Canadians. And this is significant because this is about as many people as were killed in World War I. So right after the war, um, war is over, but then just as many Canadians get killed by this flu virus. And combined with the war's death toll, it had a huge social and economic impact. So think of the fact that families don't have someone to go work for them, either because, you know, they're loved ones have been killed in the war, or if they had survived the war, or maybe those who didn't go off to fight, um, they may have been affected by this flu virus. This caused local governments to shut down non-essential services, so things such as theaters, places where people are meeting in public, those were getting shut down to try to avoid spreading the virus. People were encouraged to wear breathing masks, people were encouraged not to shake hands in public. And we saw other events cancelled because of this as well, the 1919 Stanley Cup. Uh, was cancelled as a result of this flu pandemic after a Montreal player, Joe Hull, he died of the flu. Other members of the teams that were playing was Montreal versus Seattle in the 1919 Stanley Cup. There were members of both teams that were infected with the flu virus, and then once Joe Hall died, they decided to call off the rest of the series. And so here in these pictures, we can see how society had to deal with this virus in a variety of ways. So arenas and auditoriums, they were turned into makeshift hospitals as hospitals could not handle the influx of patients. So you'd have these public areas which were just turned into these kind of temporary hospitals to try to treat the patients. You can see, you know, people don't have their own rooms. They're all just kind of spread out uh, in these open spaces. People wore masks in public to try to avoid breathing in the flu virus. And people had to deal with the dead somehow. So this picture is of a mass grave that was made for victims in Newfoundland. Uh, again, you have all these people dying at once, so you need to do something with their bodies. Society also had to deal with the influx of soldiers returning home from the war. At the end of the war, soldiers returned home to find many challenges. Many had little formal education or skills training. Uh, Coming out of the war, about 70,000 had been injured or disabled, and the government needed to do something about them, or they could become jobless, unemployable, or homeless. So how did the government respond to this? One thing they did was set up vocational schools so that veterans could receive job-specific training. The government passed the Soldier Settlement Act of 1919, which provided veterans who wanted to become farmers with land grants. Pensions began to be paid to veterans, as well as widows and children of deceased soldiers. Now, although these efforts helped, many veterans found it difficult to maintain a job, as many were forced to deal with chronic financial and physical issues, as well as the effects of uh, mental health issues, such as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And finally, there was also lots of labor unrest from workers following the war. After the war, many people became frustrated with their working conditions. During the war, businesses were making large profits, but wages for workers remained low and did not keep up with the inflation caused by the war's end. When soldiers returned home, they found that their jobs were gone, and as a result, many remained unemployed or were forced to work for much less money. And these issues kind of climaxed with the Winnipeg General Strike. It began on May 15, 1919, when almost all of Winnipeg's workers went on strike. And these strikers came from a variety of fields, those working in factories, those working in office jobs. They came from a wide variety of places of public life. And the goals of the strike were to have higher wages and the establishment of collective bargaining rights. Uh, and one of the leaders of the strike, you can see in the left-hand corner here, is a man, J.S. Woodsworth, who goes on to found the CCF, which later becomes the NDP that we know today. Now, the government was opposed to the strike, and many were fearful that it could become violent. 
if you remember back to uh, 1917, the Russian Revolution happened, and, and very similar sentiments were had, were sort of going on in Russia. Um, so they had the, this labor unrest, and that was one of the things that helped lead to the overthrow of their government and the establishment of a communist state. So the government of Canada was fearful that the strike was started by a foreign conspiracy, that uh, those in Russia were perhaps trying to spread their ideas to Canada, that this was part of a communist plot. So fearing the worst, the government acted to end the strike by any means necessary. And on June 17th, the strike leaders were arrested. On June 21st, the RCMP was sent to break up a crowd of about 25,000 protesters uh, in what was, became known as Bloody Sunday. So the strike was put down. And despite the fact that you know all these uh, workers' issues were brought to the forefront, not many changes were seen immediately. But this is, again, an important step in terms of starting to see labor rights become an important issue in Canada. Um, and as the decades went on, this is when we start to see um, movement around issues such as a minimum wage or reducing the number of work hours in a week. Um, the labor movement becomes much stronger following the Winnipeg general strike, e even if those uh, goals were not accomplished immediately afterwards. So in summary, Canadian society underwent many changes following World War I. Arthur Meehan became Prime Minister following Borden's retirement, but he was unable to hold on to power as he lost the following election to William Lyon Mackenzie King. The Spanish flu pandemic spread around the world and killed about 50,000 Canadians. As soldiers returned home, they faced many challenges, including a lack of education, jobs, and supports. And labor groups were unhappy with working conditions across Canada, culminating with the Winnipeg General Strike. 